I recently did a panel at a Woodfire conference which was titled The Thread You Follow. And it's based on a poem from um, William Stafford. And and I, I I think about this is the front of my kiln here. Um, and I think about this idea of the thread, it's like, you know, the path, the idea, the the itch of an the itch of an idea that you have to scratch. Um, and as a wood fire, I feel like I often have to um, explain about the thread. People wonder, like, why do you go to all this effort for dark <laughs> box? <laughs> 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 You're going to stack them in this kiln that's like a hole in the ground, and you're going to fire it for how many days, and you're going to wait how long, and it's going to look like that when you're done. But um, it's, you know, it, it continues to intrigue me. So I just thought I'd start with um, an idea first, which are these moon jars. So I, I think when I talk about pots, this is another version of a moon jar. When I teach throwing and I talk about pots, I always start from this idea of a bowl. That I think of pottery as the basic form of pottery as being a bowl. And that, that when you're learning to throw, I like to teach bowls because you can see what's going on with your inside hand and your outside hand and you have a sense of volume. It's not just about the silhouette but it's about that interior space. But then you can build from the bowl. So these moon vases are basically two bowls put together. So in this case, it's two shallow bowls put together, and these lines are the attachment. And I fire my wood kiln once or twice a year. Uh, and when I think about stacking the kiln, it holds upwards of 400 pieces. I kind of have these ideas of what's going to go in different places. It's like putting together a three-dimensional puzzle, and I have to, it's not just like cut bowls and plates. It's like there's all these different shapes. I try to think about how the flame moves through the kiln. And so there's always a series of these moon bases. And these pieces are um, two bowls, shallow bowls put together with this kind of rough edge. And I'm starting from, this is like a more recent piece. Um, and there's been this, like I've had this image in the back of my mind that I've been trying to scratch the itch of for all these years. And each, each time I fire the kiln, there's a slightly different series of these. There's this it's, basic, it's a basic recipe, two bowls put together with the attachment of the edge and the feeling, you know, how do I vary the opening, how do I vary the, the seam, how does it sit, how is it fired. So these are fired on their side, where that moon shape is in the upper left hand corner. There's a, a pad of clay sitting there that I call a cookie with a little teacup or sake cup or small piece that's interrupting the flame and creating that ash pattern. Um, so you know, another variation, these were kind of moon boats. <laughs> um, this firing had bloating throughout the, the kiln, and the bloating was so extreme, I decided to claim it. Like, this is what I meant. <laughs> um, and, a side opening. Would that have a cookie too? Uh, let's see. Yeah. So that's what that circle is. There. Um, yeah. This one was fired standing up. This is a really big piece. And to get the, I fire them up in the arc of the kiln. It's very hard when they're big to get them up there on the wads. And um, so this one was, was standing up. Side opening, a square version. Um, the cut surface, and then the ver the very first ones were very flat. Like I just had this very shallow idea of a curve, 
Um, and I wanted these really rough edges as if it either just emerged out of the ground or it was broken like this or something. But they all leaked. And it was impossible to get my hand in there to really seal the edges. So they've gotten fatter so that I can, um, I feel like they are work better as a completed form. And this is one of the very first ones from this whole series. Um, this is probably 20 years ago. So this was more like a really thrown flat bottom with just an edge put together. And, um, but it was the beginning idea of how to fire them. And you know, you see something that you like, and then think about what do you want to amplify, or what don't you like, and how do you change the idea from there. Um, my dad was a, a sculptor, and uh, I think that I grew up in New York City, um, and I talk about my dad a lot because he was, this is an exhibition of his out in Long Island in Rich Hampton. These are his sculptures of the portrait of my younger brother and me sitting there. Um, there were portraits of all of his children in this exhibition. Um, but his sense of material and um, kind of the, his theories about making things really influenced um, my sense of making things. I'll come back to more stories about him. For instance, um, when I was in high school, we, we moved to a loft in Soho. My parents were some of the first legal artists in residence loft spaces. There were lots of illegal people before then. Um, and I saved up my babysitting money and I wanted to buy a kiln. And he said, okay, I'll buy a kiln with you. We'll, I'll match you on it. We bought this little kiln. And then I said, well, what do we do about a glaze? He goes, well, the southern potters made glaze by crushing up glass, and we could do that. So we crushed up Coke bottles in a <laughs> pillowcase with a hammer, and then he had a blender in his studio, so we put the glass and the water and Elmer's glue in there and mixed it up, and then I dipped my pots in the stuff that was held in solution, and it turned into kind of a bumpy glaze. <laughs> But I, I tell the story because it's the, arch, the architecture of an idea. And I think that's what I, I got from my dad was that he wasn't so much about giving me formulas of, or a formulaic way of working, but the structure of an idea. And you know, as we work in the workshop, it's, um, that's what I hope to give you is sort of the, the architecture of a recipe versus the specific formula of, you know, this is what you do first, this is what you do second, this is, and that maybe it helps you to scratch the edge of the idea that's been in the back of your mind. Um, and so as I work, I think about how there are these kind of three parts of um, what bring my work together. One is how it's fired, two is what the clay is, and three is the vocabulary of the form. So first I'll talk about the firing. This is my anagama. So it's a big kiln, about 20 some odd feet long. It's about five feet tall at the tallest part, about five feet wide. And when we're stacking it, that brick area where it's red hot and that little door is, that all comes out and we're inside. Um, this is another view of the kiln and the studio. So I think of firing in the wood kiln as being um, like a collaboration. It's a collaboration between me, the kiln, the heat, my hand, my partner. Um, and it's a kind of seasonal approach fire once or twice a year, my husband and I stoking in front of the kiln. Um, so in some ways, making pots for the wood kiln is more like being a farmer. Like you have you know, this big crop of pots and these big ideas that you're following through on, these long series of objects, before you get to see them come through to fruition. 
And then once they're fired, then you know it takes time to sand them and see what are the good ones and um, and then find homes for them because it's kind of esoteric work. It doesn't just you know jump off the shelf. <laughs> and, um, so the front of the kiln gets four big pots usually. In the top arch, you can see one of the moon jars laying on its side, the, on the right hand side. Um, the dust prints go on the floor in the back. Um, there's me after me on the stack is one of my favorite plates. So I in in the workshop I was talking about kind of these um, the the parts of my kiln where um, it's cool and then other parts where it's warmer. So in this one part of the kiln, I do these plate bowl cup stacks. So in this area, there's nothing. I don't do any dust print or anything. So the plates get spread out. I get about eight plates in this part of the kiln. And each plate then has a bowl sitting on it. And each bowl has a cup sitting in it. I could stack this area. It's higher, but having it stacked more loosely, it brings the flame through this part of the kiln, and I get eight really beautiful plates. So it's really worth it to um, dedicate this space to these plates. So these are the bowls. Um, so they, you can, with that, that pattern in the center is where a cup sat and the ash moved through create that kind of flame pattern. Um, they call these dark eye plates. So they just have the bowl sitting on them that interrupted. So each one has a slightly different pattern, but the quality of the patterns relate. Um, so you end up feeling quite similar. So um, I often talk about the seeds of ideas, like where do ideas come from? So um, we'll talk a little bit more about these dust prints that we've been talking about. In my kiln, um, you know, there's this cool area on the floor that didn't get much action. And I tried a lot of things there. I tried putting grasses in between my place. I tried putting corn husks. I tried, and none of it was very satisfactory. So I was looking at these Han Dynasty jars, where they're, these are Chinese jars, where they're beginning to understand how to make hotter firings, and noticing how the ash was um, deposited on the shoulders of pieces. So, you know, the Chinese were really good engineers and artists, so they paid attention to that, and they said, okay, what if we applied that ash um, and then what if we mix the ash with clay and you know, it becomes more like a glass-like surface. So this historical progression was instructive to me to say, like, oh, I could be putting this ash on my material. So I talked about, you know, the first time I did it, I. I just sifted ash on my plate in my studio. I walked out to the kiln. It was a little windy and ash blew off, so that was not work. So then I put, I pressed it into the clay. Oh, right, then I did the Elmer's glue. So I used Elmer's glue and I sifted the ash and I fired my plates upside down. So then the Elmer's glue burned out, the ash fell on the backs of the plates. It sort of started to work, but it wasn't where I wanted it. So then I realized, okay, I have to press the ash into the surface of the plate um, to say, to get that surface. But the first time I did it, I did way too much ash. So there's this trial and error in remembering. And I'm always thinking about my landscape and how does my landscape inform what I'm making. And these are the kinds of landscapes I love to see. It's like I'm walking out with my dog and it's, you know, it's just the field and the sky. And that's what I wanted to represent in these plates, the grammar of the horizon, the grammar of the landscape. So these were some of the first 
successful dust prints um, where I thought of a natural landscape, a serious set of the landscape. Um, and I just felt like they really resonated beautifully with um, food. And as a young student, I studied painting in the south of France of Aix en Provence, where Cezanne had his studio. And part of our practice with students there was to go out and look at the landscape with reproductions of the paintings. And I realized that in looking at Cezanne's paintings, that it wasn't like this construct of um, abstraction. He was really looking at this mountain. And it was as if the vision of what he was looking at was coming through his eyes and through his body and out his hand. So it's like testing your hand against the landscape or against the material. So I'm often really looking at my own local landscape. This is out behind my house into the most smoky area and these winter grasses. And then white slip with red dust drawn. The white slip wet and the red dust print pressed into the surface of the clay. And then here's a fire surface of wood fire of those plates. Um, and this is a more uh, recent version of um, an ash dust print on a big platter and some other versions of red slip of red dust over white slip. And here you see um, kind of the process of I had I had put this wet um, red wet slip on this piece of paper and then dusted the white dust and then written this is a poem from my mother um, my mom was a printmaker and a poet and it was about the poem was about you know what what was going to happen to all her belongings and how were her children going to clear out the house and uh, her banks of books and piles of prints um, climbing the walls like innocent caterpillars Wow, she was so prescient. We had no, you know, it was a really tough thing <laughs> clearing out their house. Um, and here's a, a fired ash print. There's a poem inscribed. The ash is the paint. Is the, the ash is sort of in the grayish, the gray on the right hand side. So it's a poem written through. And the red part on the left hand side, that's the atmospheric fire. And this is um, a, a white clay dust print on the platter. And this is um, the red slip of the white slip. And I, don't, I think I forgot to read the poem earlier how from William Stafford. So um, the way it is by William Stafford, there's a thread you follow. It goes among things that change, but it doesn't change. People wonder about what you were pursuing. You have to explain about the thread. But it's hard for others to see. While you hold it, you can't get lost. Tragedies happen. People get hurt or die. And you suffer and get old. Nothing you can do can stop times unfolding, and you don't ever let go of the thread. So that's the poem that's inscribed here. But I feel like it's been um, very much the thread in my, my work for a number of years. Um, so going back to um, historical ideas, um, this is a mold that's in the freer, in the, in the collection of the freer from the Chinese Ding Dynasty. And the, they think that these molds were used to press wet clay into for these very decorative bowls that have these iron rims. It's a, not a very good slide, so you can't really see the decoration in there. Um, and I took a group of students down to look at these forms and pots in the collection. And we decided as a project to try and imitate that. So I made these forms and wrote 
poems and stuff in them and then tried pressing. It was actually very difficult to make it work and I'm not sure it's really what those forms were used for, but um, that was the theory at the time. But it led me into this whole idea about writing and whether something is legible. This is a, an epi a Korean epitaph play. I can't read Korean, but there's something about knowing that there's meaning behind the, the writing that's important to me and looking at it for pattern and emotion and history. So these are all epitaphs that were buried in this um, vivid form. I think it's like a really incredible idea. And this is another epitaph cup written not only on the outside, but the inside. Um, but it led me to come back to, to these, these dust prints. And you know they, they get distorted. My handwriting is bad. And they're backwards. Mm -hmm. So the potential for reading these is difficult. So this is when I'm dusting and writing through the dust. And then these are some of my, what I call, poem cups. I have a couple of these in the studio in the other room. They're very small. They're the thinnest thing I make. The writing is completely abstracted. Um, but there's that quality of knowing there's an intention there. And this is a thrown poem cup. And these are poem beakers. And these are bigger, like, more like a, big coffee cup. And um, when I some of the earlier poem plates, these this was after Obama was um, inaugurated. Elizabeth Alexander um, was the inaugural poet and read a poem called Praise Song of the Day at the Inauguration. And, and um, so my way of trying to memorize the poem I can't recite now, was to write it over and over and over again in the slip. So I made these plates which were based on that poem. And then I had some curators in my studio. And they're like, oh, you're an Obama supporter? I was like, yeah. I was like, well, maybe we can sell them to him. So, <laughs> <laughs> so he bought them as a gift for um, Janet Sirleaf Johnson, or Janet Johnson Sirleaf, who's the um, first female head of state in Africa, won the Nobel Peace Prize, which is pretty cool. And then I did a series of covered jars, sorry, this is not a good photo on here. Oh, look at this one. Um, these were for Michelle Obama for the UN General Assembly. I made a hundred little covered jars, which held chamomile tea from the White House Garden. And they were gifts to the spouses of the people who came to the General Assembly. Of course, they had no idea how long it takes to design and make stuff, and they wanted it on an impossible um, time frame. So these were single fired in my electric kiln. <laughs> Coming back to my more normal mud and dirt, I'm always scratching in the dirt and talk a little bit about clay. So this is a clay mine in Maryland um, near the Susquehanna River. On the, this is an old photograph. It's probably 20 years old now. Um, as you go over 95, you cross the Susquehanna River, and this mine is, is just past there. And there, it's basically a sand and gravel mine. So clay is their byproduct, and this is these are all stoneware temperature plays. Um, and it's been a really interesting source for me in terms of inspiration and support and excitement that this, you know, one person's mud can be another person's clay. <laughs> um, so, you know, these piles and the, the erosion, um, possibility, all of it has been very much an inspiration. And then in when NSEQA was in Baltimore, I'm trying to 
kind of thing. I think it was 2005, six, something like that. We did an exhibition in the mine, which was called Coming Home. So a group of artists who all made things from the play brought fire objects back and exhibited them in the, um, in the mine, which was really a powerful moment. And I thought, like, when I, this is me installing, I thought, like, the clay was going to be easy to carve, but <laughs> it was dry and frozen, and it was like, I felt more like a cliff dweller than, you know, um, than what I imagined it to be. I have a cold chisel and a hammer making little spots that um, work. But coming back to sort of concepts of how I work, um, Growing up, you know, my family, we always, my, my parents both worked at home, so we always had soup and sandwiches for lunch. And it was always Campbell's soup. And my dad and I would have these conversations about, you know, why do you make pots? What, do you, what are you trying to do? And he would get frustrated because my cups were always different. Like, he always wanted to know that his cup of coffee was going to be six ounces of coffee. <laughs> so he would, point to this Campbell's soup can, and we were talking about, you know, when I buy a can of Campbell's soup, it's always the same. I can count on it being the same red, and the same saltiness, and the same flavor. And I was like, yeah, but that's why I make soup. Because <laughs> it's different. And, you know, it has all these different qualities. And that's why I make cups, is that it's, you know, got this, this quality of expression um, and so it's you know the commercial versus the artistic and I bring it back to my clay mixing too that I have a sort of a general recipe for mixing clay it's like my soup recipe and I know kind of what I can vary and and like the you know this year maybe your tomatoes were fabulous or maybe they were really acidic, you know, maybe you have tons of basil, and your soup's going to be different, and then my clay is going to be different, my firing is different, um, and that's part of my um, intent. So I'm always looking at materials, both commercial materials and local materials. This is my gra sand and gravel mine. This is the salt. This is that four miles from where I live. And they're they're blasting rock out of out of the ground and then grinding it up for all sorts of different sizes. So this is what the mine itself looks like. The salt is sort of a crystalline shaped rock. And then they blast this stuff out. They have this thing called a gorilla, which is like big steel fingers. <laughs> Pick up rock and sift to like, you know, number one rip rap is as big as this table, and then you know it goes smaller and smaller down to super fine material. And when I first started going there, I would go and, and collect um, stuff from the tire tracks from these enormous vehicles, and 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 I was so excited about it. I came home and I put this big piece of cardboard on my wheel and I painted these spirals and I made these prints with the slab off of my spiral. Well, there's where the clay was, and here's the piece fire. Um, so this material, eight mesh, um, melts the ramp concept into kind of a black glaze. So it became another material that I was messing around with. So I'm, you know, my friends were building a pond, and they said, "Come on over and see what you find in terms of clay." So when I look at this, that in the sort of upper third of the screen, there's a kind of slightly greasy spot. And that's where the clay, where the, the, the bulldozer, or whatever the piece of equipment was, scraped it and it's slightly plastic. And I go, okay, that looks interesting. So again, I went and picked up these chunks of clay from the tire tracks. And I, I just find the chunks interesting, of course. <laughs> But then, you know, what do you make out of it? And so I sieved it into different, um, different mesh sizes and look 
fired both the clay, but also the particles that I sieved out to see what those things were like, to find out whether that material might be interesting, um, and what it did. So I, I, it's not a particularly plastic clay, but I like this kind of gritty stuff. So in this one, I pressed it around the rims and on the backs of these plates. And then this is fired in my kiln. So the really gritty stuff is on the rim. And the back got this kind of very metallic, like starry night feeling that were um, really interesting. So there's this um, quality of, you know, the, the permanent fire thing and the momentary wet thing. So going back to Chinese history, these are more Han Dynasty shapes. I've always loved this kind of cocoon shape or goose egg shape. And I'm, this is a piece of lawn and this is what kind of based on that idea. Um, but after looking at the black ones, I found out that these were really tombware, and the original ones were decorated with slip. And in the history books, it's called cold slips or cold painted slips which meant they're not fire, yeah. <laughs> because it was just tombware. These things were painted and were beautiful, went into the tomb. They didn't need to be washed or anything. They just stayed there. And some of these things had lasted thousands of years, um, which gave me great permission to say, I can do that too. Um, <laughs> so in 2020, before lockdown, January of 2020, I went down to Starworks, and I did a residency. Starbucks is a, in North Carolina. It's an old sock factory that's been turned into a clay business and a, an incubator for lots of small businesses. And um, I was doing material research. So I was mixing small mixes of clay bodies to bring back and fire in my kiln. And this is a clay called Okalimi. It's a high iron, um, very or difficult kind of clay to work with. So I ended up doing this series of paintings based on what these raw clays look like. So this is sort of my key to my material. So there's Catawba yellow, Catawba dark, Okalimi, purple tamarind, white porcelain, black candor, lazo. All these names are places in that area of, of North Carolina. And um, I, did this, I did these paintings, which are bisque um, surfaces, and then raw clays printed onto them, because I liked them just as they were. Once they got fired, they all turned shades of brown. <laughs> I wanted to re retain some of these blues and you know, rich reds and yellows and, and violet that um, was just kind of magical. So these are installed at um, Star Wars in um, a wild play exhibition. About my wood kiln, but I also have a gas kiln. And um, right now I'm, I'm working towards um, building my gas kiln. And so when I, I talked about earlier this morning, when I'm glazing, I glaze super thin over what I've done on my clay so that I can still see the feeling of the clay. And an important part of my whole career has been working for a restaurant in New York called Omen Azen. I've been, they've been open for over 40 years now and have been making pots for them for that long. So um, this is Mikio Shinagawa, who was the original owner of um, Omen. And in the 80s, it was just an incredible place. That it, it, the art world ate there. I remember being there. Louise Nelson was, was um, celebrating her 80 some odd birthday. And you know, seen all sorts of interesting people there and met all sorts of interesting people that we never had access to otherwise. Um, this was a special dinner we did um, called the White Nights. <laughs> um, and uh, I brought 
they, they bring a lot of plates from Japan, but for this dinner it was all pot my pots. And I make what they think of as their large plates, which are sort of the 10 inch realm. Um, and so, but I, I, I went and had dinner there in March, and um, they brought out some old, they served our dinner on some very old pieces like this. This plate in the foreground, I think, was from the late 80s. And it was just really nice to see these things still in use. The bowl on the top there, I think it made about 10 years ago, and that's um, a vegan um, uh, mushroom dish. So, in our, this is from a poster that was at, at uh, Penland. <laughs> You know, this might be what you feel during our workshop today. It's <laughs> like, oh, this is awesome. And then you start hearing going, this is tricky. And then you go, this is shit. I am shit. <laughs> this might be OK. And then this is awesome. <laughs> Just remember this. This is a really good thing to remember. <laughs> There's a level of uncertainty in all of this work. Um, so I often describe to people that um, I, I like to quote Miro, who said, um, I work like a gardener, and I, I think of planting my seeds of ideas um, in you know, the soil of my studio, and I'm, I come back to um, revisit things, and there's this kind of seasonal knowledge, whether you're harvesting or planting. Um, and so these are, you know, some of my materials, the Vulcan, red stencils, Okanini, a play from Montana. Um, and I have a lot of reminders in my studio. This is one of them from William Kentridge. My job is to make art, not sense. Um, and in my own process, um, I work in these sketchbooks all the time, and my sketchbooks are a really important part of how I process what I'm looking at, and how it comes into play, and um, kind of how I move forward. And and um, about ten years ago, I had a show. I was in a show here at Biz Arts where I um, displayed a whole wall of pages from this sketchbook, um, or from these sketchbooks. And uh, so this is one of my little collages in one of my sketchbooks. And then a, a, a vase, a dust print vase that's been thrown and stretched. And bottles with a drawing of the wall behind it. And so, um, you know, this, this section is sort of the vocabulary of form. Um, these pieces are started by throwing kind of a, a flange and then adding a slab to the top. Um, Foldy vases, teapots, and call these shield vases, and dust print from the back of the hill, the white slip with um, the red clay. Faceted piece, a different kind of faceting. These are the shovel plates, and it, so the other part of it is, you know, to keep going. And you assess um, what you've made, and you keep going. <laughs> that that don't, if you have failures, learn from them and keep going. Um, so, <coughs> the studio with a shield base. You know, like I was, we were talking about part of what I love in clay is the quality of movement in the clay, and that I'm trying to retain that movement once it's fired. 
And so when you're throwing, when you're making pots, you know, you're dealing with these different forces. There's, there's centrifugal force, there's gravity, um, there's the pressure that your hand puts into it. And how do you kind of use those qualities, those forces in your favor to create what you want to create? So like these pieces, I fire them upside down so that the gravity and the warpage that happens in firing works with the pots, that the curves are, are enhanced rather than fighting against the curves. Um, and I think that, you know, when I'm teaching, I often tell people that in my class, you know, you have permission to make the worst shit in the world. But I also kind of tell that to myself, like that, that I have to go into the studio with um, a certain kind of stupidity so that the material has something to teach me. If I have all the answers before I make the object, um, then that feels like it's sort of, it's, all the answers are there, it's like commercial, it's like overly designed. And that's not what's interesting to me in, um, in making something. And so it's a, a quality of giving and receiving. I try to keep my critic, my inner critic in check. And to, to find a kind of eloquent balance between those voices that are running around in my head um, and that quality of knowing where you're going and not knowing where you're going. And so, you know, I, I tell people when I'm, when I'm working that A, I have a very broad definition of what's functional. So here's a base that, that <laughs> split in the firing, but I still think it's an interesting base and it's been really fun to put flowers in. Um, but I, when I sit down to work, I always have an intention as to like where, what I'm trying to do. But then I'm very accepting of um, what happens then, and that that you know I talk about one of my my catchphrases in teaching is like work with the pot you have, not the pot you imagine you have. You know what what is really here. And um, that's, that's a really kind of helpful um, reminder. And um, that I'm always aiming in this work for both this quality of strength and a quality of vulnerability that um, it's both know, fragile, and has the potential to last for thousands of years. Um, and um, so, you think about what you want to say. So, thanks. That's it. I'd love if you have questions or thoughts. I do the same. So right. you're kind of going through that same process with the penland thing. You kind of like, um, there's a long time of reviewing that work. And there's so many times you touch it. Yes. So, and you're yet, and yet, you're, you're approaching it with great risk, right? Every time you start a new firing, you have a lot at risk. Do. And a lot that you've played with that you don't know yep. what's happening. So I guess age, right? It's persistence and yeah. age and mature and maturity to know that over the time. I mean, I, I have an expression that call that says something like, "You should live long enough." You know, you should live long enough to be able to see this work 
go through the ebb and flow and get to that thread that you've been pulling at, right? right? Yeah, I think it's I think it's faith too. It's faith that there'll be even if the like you know I showed that image of the firing with all the blows. I mean I was pretty upset when I opened that kill. Um, but there were some good pots in there still. You know, I was still able to say, you know, there are some, there's some beautiful things here. And um, I like to say that otters are, we are real optimists. <laughs> <laughs> we are always thinking it's going to be better the next one. <laughs> yeah. oh, wow. But like, wood fire potters are even, you know, yeah. like you But can, also, like, I with, think, I think the gift that potters have, that maybe you don't even know you have, is that you can see into the future. <laughs> that you, um, you know, we are, are thinking all the time about how do things shrink? How do they transform in firing? Um, what is it going to look like? And so, you know, going into a wood firing, you you always have those things. You're like, okay, you know, I've done all this planning. I've taken these risks. Here we go. Then once you unload it, you have to let go of the preconceived idea and see the things for what they are. That takes me a while. And and um, every time that I've had to take a photo, like. You know, immediately, let's say I have a show coming up and immediately I need a new image and I take that photo within the first 24 hours. Mm. Later I go, why did they choose that piece? Yes. <laughs> but yes. Like, that wasn't really the representative piece of this body of work. It, and you know, there's that other thing, sometimes you, you hold things aside, you're like, I don't know, I don't know about that thing. And I think that's, that's a good place. You know, I, I describe like my sense of what I think is being really interesting. Like there's obvious beauty and there's obvious ugliness. And there's, you know, the X and Y um, axes. And it's this place in the middle here that's really interesting. Some days you go, that thing is ugly, and other times you go, oh, that's really beautiful, and it sort of varies there. Those are the things that really, like, hold my attention. I remember going to a talk by Sean Scully, and, and him talking about how, the painter, and going to look at Mirandi paintings, and he would, some days he'd look at them and he'd go, these colors are just so muddy. You know, I just can't understand why he's, he's not what everybody says he is. And then other days ago, this guy was the most incredible colorist. <laughs> and I think that's that thing. That what is it that that holds your attention? I think that's really interesting. And you know, like this piece that's broken. You know, there's these moments that I'm like, oh this is great. You know, other moments it's still in my studio. <laughs> I mean, it's still in my gallery space. It's not like anybody's been like, I need that thing. <laughs> you know? But, um, you know, I still think it's pretty interesting. And, and, but, you know, I move it around. I try it in different orientations. So it's holding my, it holds my attention. And have you tried growing something in it? I have not. I have another question. Yes. Other people. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I'm intrigued by the fact that you fire only once or twice a year, um, which means that you can't like me quick corrections to to things. So, no. Um, how does that work in your mind? That you know, if you want to try something new, you have to wait until the you know six months or so until the firing is finished, and then try something else. Yeah. I make notes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I love patience. Mm -hmm. And I, and I, yeah, I mean, that's why I have sketchbooks, right? So, and, and I take photographs. Like, I photograph, I photograph the stacking of the firing, and photograph the unstacking of the firing. So if there's some piece, you know, six months later, I'm like, oh, this is interesting. Where was this in the film? And, you know, 
know, how do I recreate this? How do I build on this? It, that's the trick. That's a, it's a skill. And but I I think I what I love about it is I like the long lead time. I like that moment when you're like right now. I still have time to make things before I fire my gas kiln, and I'm like, yay, I have clay, I have time, I have you know, energy. This is great. And um, that's really the exciting moment. It's really hard to, you know, to stop and say, okay, it, you know, wet work is over. That's, that's a hard moment. It's a different time frame. And every once in a while, you know, I I fire an electric kiln. <laughs> it's not, you know, I, I, it's not to say the wood kiln is the end all be all. It's just you know what where what I ended up loving and doing. And like when we built the kiln, my husband and I built it, and he it was going to be his kiln, but I'm the one who ended up. <laughs> and and in some ways I think it fits my personality more and, and he's he's has more of a training as an engineer and he's more precise and and a more predictable firing is actually more in keeping with his personality. But he loves to fire, so he's there to help. Yeah. <laughs> So you, I'm just curious about the parental thing. The so you, the parental thing. The so parental your, thing. Your father. Oh my well, the, the, yeah. the Campbell soup. Yeah, can and the conversation around that. Yeah. So he was making art. Yeah, he was. And he was uh, did, did engaged in materials that yes. probably were not predictable to the nth degree. He was using mostly well the aluminum, but he did fire some clay. He made some and yet. He wanted repetition, or at least a calculated result that said, "This is a muck." Um, oh, well, I think this is the difference between, like, you know, as, in terms of function, he wanted a certain kind of predictability in the functional object, and with the with artistic objects. He was more forgiving of, of I see. So he could move cross over. Not as well. <laughs> Interesting. I, so, you know, my jokey answer when people say, well, how, you know, why did you become a potter? It's I'm like, because they come from a family of artists and the walls were full. <laughs> 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 yeah. Yeah.